Hello, everyone. Here we are again for another one of our live conversations. And these are live conversations. I always am amused when I see in the chat, people say, is this live? Is this live? Yeah, it's live if you're watching it live, right? If you're not watching it live, it's not live. And I don't know, maybe just to uh, establish that fact, it's always good to uh, respond in real time. There was one question here from someone in Fiji. I don't know where the, the question went, question went, I should say, it had to do with black holes and string theory. Uh, if you want to ask that question again, our participant from Fiji, I'll uh, try to look at it. But the main event today, as you all know, is a conversation with Lenny Suskind, who is really one of the great theoretical physicists of our time. So that's an exciting guest to have on the program. As many of you know, Lenny has had profound impact in string theory, black hole physics, quantum mechanics, elementary particle physics. I mean, it's um, quite a lot, quite a lot of accomplishments. And we'll obviously only be talking about part of those insights, but I think we'll likely skew heavily on black holes. You know, as you reach the end of a year, there's a tendency to think back on the good things, the bad things, summarize, you know, there are all these best of lists, worst of lists, things of that sort. If I was going to focus upon the best of physics, or let's say theoretical physics in 2020, even perhaps even earlier, black holes would be near the top, perhaps at the top, you know, we've had um, a great run and it is continuing onward. And we're going to discuss today some of the puzzles that remain, but some of the deep puzzles of the past that today just are not as puzzling any longer. It's not that everything has been resolved. Right? It's rare that deep puzzles just get fully, thoroughly resolved. But there are many things that were very unclear even as early as uh, 15, 20, 25 years ago that now have really been unraveled. And Lenny and a bunch of other folks that will no doubt make reference to, critical to making that happen. So Lenny will join us at about 1.30 or so. I'll do a, a little bit of Q&A, maybe just a couple of questions if there's something to get us going. Uh, and then I'll maybe give a... I don't know, a little background to the conversation that we're going to have with Lenny. So here's a question from Captain Viam. How are dark energy and dark matter related? Captain Viam asks. And I like questions like that because the answer is short. Basically, I don't know, and nobody does know how these dark things are related. They may be related, they may not be related. Remember, dark matter is this idea of matter that is out there, we believe, in space. And we come to that conclusion because when we take account of the gravity that can be exerted by the matter that's not dark, which means matter that we can see, gives off light, reflects light, matter of that sort, the amount of gravity that such matter can exert just is not enough to account for the motions that we see through astrophysical measurements, astrophysical data, right? I mean, the analogy that I'd like to use, I think it's a pretty good one. If you have a, a bicycle wheel that's wet as it spins, you know that the water droplets fly off as the wheel turns. Similarly, in galaxies that are spinning, if they're spinning at a sufficiently fast rate, stars should be flung outward. And we see galaxies for which the stars should be flung outwards, but they're not, which must mean there's something else out there that's holding those stars inside of those galaxies. The belief is that there's additional matter beyond the matter that we can see with our telescopes, and that dark matter is responsible for the gravitational pull that's keeping those stars from flying outwards like the water droplets. Good, that's dark matter. I should say, there's a lot of dark matter, we think, when you do these calculations there's on the order of four or five times as much dark matter as there is ordinary matter, you know, the stuff that we're made of. Dark energy is a different beast. Dark energy, the most convincing evidence for it 
are these observations that we've discussed in this series from time to time of the accelerated expansion of space. Space is not only getting larger over time, that was a shock, right? That was the shock that initially was really confirmed through the observations of Edwin Hubble. But not only is the universe getting bigger, it's getting bigger at an accelerated clip. So the expansion is speeding up. How can expansion speed up, right? Galaxies, they pull on each other with the force of gravity. Force of gravity, we usually think of as pulling things inward, but yet something's pushing outward. And the remarkable thing is that in Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, gravity can actually be repulsive. It can push outward. Not if the source of that gravity is a clump like a star, a clump like a galaxy, a clump like a planet. Rather, if there's a diffuse energy that is spread uniformly throughout a region of space, then under modest assumptions, it will give rise to a repulsive push, an outward push that can drive the expansion of space to accelerate. And because this energy does not itself give off light, we call it dark energy. So there are the two dark things, dark matter, dark energy. And again, I gave you the amount of dark matter. Dark energies, in terms of the energy mass budget of the universe is even more substantial. On the order of 70% of the mass energy of the universe is this dark energy. So that are these two components. Now, are they related? Many people have written down theories which suggest that they are. None of these have really gained the consensus of the scientific community as yet, but who knows? You know, they both have dark in their name. Is that the end of the connection or is it deeper? I don't know. All right, anyway, so that's a, a good question to get us going here. Mark Kennedy also asks, how much do you miss Mama Joy's? I, I don't know what that means, but it does ring a bell. Somewhere deep in my childhood or something, I know what you're talking about, Mark, I think, or maybe not. Maybe it's something that I don't want to remember. I don't know. But anyway, I can't answer the question because I don't remember exactly what it means. A quick one more before we head on to a little bit of background. Uh, Physics Forever asks, what are strings made of? We'll talk a little bit about string theory here today, no doubt. Lenny Susskind, founding father, pioneer of string theory. I'm sure it will come up in our conversation. And look, when you think about any proposal for what stuff is made of, and you think back on the history of ideas, any proposal for what stuff is made of seem to ultimately have finer stuff inside of it, right? Molecules made of atoms, atoms, yeah, nucleus with electrons in these fuzzy quantum orbits. The nucleus has smaller things, protons and neutrons, inside protons and neutrons, smaller things called quarks. So string theory is right. Big F, really. We'll talk about that. Then inside of these particles are these little vibrating filaments, these string-like filaments of energy. So if that's the correct picture, a natural question is, is at the end of the line, have we reached the smallest of the Matryoshka dolls, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, no doubt somebody will correct me. You know, the Russian dolls, each has a smaller doll inside of it. Is it that strings have some smaller entity inside of them too? I don't know. Could be strings at the end of the line. Could be that there are finer ingredients. In some sense, string theory even suggests that possibility with things called D0 particles at some level. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit too. But it's a natural question and one that uh, we don't fully uh, know the answer to. So that's two questions that we don't know for the answer to. Maybe there's a question here that I can actually answer. That would be that would be nice. Give me a little uh, boost to keep on going. Um, um, yeah, another question about string theory. Let me just find uh, uh, Tishya Patel. Can we describe the fabric of space time as made of particles? <laughs> I seem to be drawn to the questions that I can't answer here this uh, this afternoon. And in a, in a sense, yes. So in the quantum mechanical framework, the forces that influence how things move, the electromagnetic force, the nuclear forces, they're all part of the standard model of particle physics, which envisions that those forces are indeed communicated 
by a particle, right? For the electromagnetic force, photons, nuclear forces, W and Z bosons and so forth. Now, gravity is a, a force of nature as well. Einstein tells us that gravity is associated with space-time. The geometrical structure of space-time determines the gravitational influence that a body moving through that region of space-time will experience. Now, if you believe, as most of us do, that quantum mechanics and general relativity have got to come together, then the paradigm of a force being communicated by a particle will spill over to the gravitational influence as well. And that gives rise to this notion of gravitons. No one has ever seen a graviton. We're not surprised by that. It's the smallest packet of the weakest of nature's forces. So it's not as though we have expected to see it lighting up our detectors and it hasn't. So not a mystery. But if this idea is true, then you can actually think of the fabric of space, which is the medium of gravity as being a whole huge collection of gravitons that are arranged in a coherent pattern that manifests on large scales as the geometry of space-time, but on small scales would have this distinct particulate quantum mechanical description. So I can't say the answer is absolutely yes, but certainly there is a natural intellectual pathway that would take us to that picture. All right, good. Let's. Um, I'm happy to again answer questions as they come through and as in the conversation with Lenny I'll try to look sometimes it's hard some of you have asked why for instance in the conversation with Roger Penrose that we had last week why I didn't turn to some of the questions that you ask and honestly I just get so carried away in the conversation sometimes with the person I'm speaking with that breaking away to try to scan through the list of questions can be difficult we do have somebody looking at those questions right now so if you ask something that's really on point highly relevant to wherever we are in the conversation with Lenny, I'm more than happy to try to bring your questions into the conversation. So um, I'm absolutely for that, open to that without a doubt. All right, so a little bit of background. Lenny will join us about 10, 12 minutes. So look, we're all now familiar that black holes are an observationally confirmed quality of reality, right? The Event Horizon Telescope, we have a little black hole image from them, of course, we can bring it up on the screen where you know, in the most direct way, you see a black hole, right? I mean, a, a black hole is nothing but a region in space where light can't get out. And the Event Horizon Telescope imagery is one that makes that, you know, the most straightforward confirmation of that idea. So I see it on my screen here. I hope you guys see it on yours, which would be good. I think you do. Now, Black holes really came out of the mathematics of Carl Schwarzschild way back in 1916, 1917 or so. And it's an idea that, you know, is interesting, exciting, but it kind of became a bit of a backwater of physics for a long period of time. It's really John Wheeler, who I think we have a little image of John Wheeler. Nice to just sort of see him. It was John Wheeler who brought the study of Einstein's general relativity and the puzzles of black hole physics. He really brought that into mainstream physics research. So he's really responsible for that. And, and John Wheeler had a very particular puzzle about black holes that we're gonna be talking about with Lenny Susskind. Wheeler worried, he was a very genteel man. He worried that if he was drinking a hot cup of tea, okay, there's a lot of entropy in a hot cup of tea. The disorder of the water molecules bouncing to and fro in that cup of tea. He worried that if there was a nearby black hole, he could take his cup of tea with the hot water, with all that entropy and just throw it into the black hole. And then he worried that if the cup of tea and the entropy went to a black hole, since black holes don't let anything to come out, the entropy in some sense would be gone. And he worried about that because the second law of thermodynamics tells us that entropy should always go up. And Wheeler said, I seem to be able to use a black hole to thwart the second law of thermodynamics. I just keep dumping entropy into a black hole, it's gone. And in that way, entropy in the rest of the universe, the observable universe perhaps is the only part that we observers ever have access to would go down. So he mentioned this puzzle 
to his student, a student named Jacob Beckenstein, a, a brilliant student. And, and Beckenstein came up with an idea to resolve this puzzle. And the idea is that black holes do have entropy. Black holes do have entropy. They're not the simple pristine objects as indicated by Einstein's general theory of relativity, where when you look at the mathematics from Carl Schwarzschild back in 1916, you find in some sense that black holes seem to be the simplest of all things in the universe. You specify their mass or also their charge and their angular momentum. You just give a couple numbers and you completely nail down what that black hole is. Whereas for us to nail down most things in the world around us, you gotta give a lot more information than just three numbers to nail it down, right? If you wanted to describe the exact physical state of my body, good luck. So many particles and so many interactions that to write down the quantum mechanical wave function, you know, the exact quantum description of my body would be pretty, pretty tough. Even the exact classical description would be pretty tough. For a black hole, the exact classical description was quite simple and that led people to wonder how in the world a black hole could have entropy. Entropy, you need something to carry the disorder, something that is able to be affected by, say, John Wheeler's cup of hot tea falling inside. But Beckenstein had a, had a beautiful argument. And the argument, a little too long to go through it completely right now, but the upshot of the argument was that if you know the area of the event horizon of a black hole, then you know the entropy of the black hole. He basically says, take the area of the event horizon of a black hole, break it up into little Planck size squares. What's the Planck length? Remember that's this little tiny length at which gravity, quantum mechanics really come together. 10 to the minus 33 centimeters is the Planck length. So the Planck length squared, a little square whose sides are the Planck length would be about 10 to the minus 66 centimeters squared, a really tiny area. But take the entire surface area of the event horizon of black hole, break it up into these little Planck size squares. And that number of those plaquettes, Planck plaquettes is the entropy of a black hole. Now, Stephen Hawking heard about this and thought it was nonsense. Didn't think that black holes could have entropy and set out to disprove Beckenstein's, Beckenstein's ideas. That was his goal. And remarkably, Stephen Hawking wound up confirming Beckenstein's ideas and going even further. He not only showed that black holes do have entropy, surprise number one, but then he said, look, in a very mathematical way that I'll just say in words, he said, look, any object that has entropy, it also has heat. Remember, heat, entropy, really wedded together and any object that has heat has a temperature and therefore black holes in some sense should glow with a particular temperature. In fact, he gave an exact formula for what the temperature of a black hole would be. Don't need the details, but it goes like one over the mass of the black hole. So now black holes are not even these simple pristine objects as Einstein's math seemed to initially suggest, but now they carried entropy, their surface area, they carried temperature, and because they carry temperature, they glow, which means that things in some sense are coming out of a black hole in a very precise way. They're not coming out from deep inside the black hole. They're really coming right from the edge, the event horizon of the black hole. But this now raised the puzzle. And the puzzle is, okay, look, if the black hole is glowing, if it's radiating, so-called Hawking radiation. In fact, we have a little Hawking radiation image. Maybe we can jump to that just to show uh, what it would look like to have a black hole Hawking radiating. You see these uh, particles of radiation streaming out from the event horizon of a black hole. So here's the puzzle. 
as this black hole continues to radiate and as it gets smaller, its mass goes down. I said the temperature goes like one over the mass. So the intensity of the radiation goes up and up and up over time. Here's the deep question. Does that radiation have any memory, any imprint of the detailed objects that fell in to the black hole to construct the black hole? Now, if you throw in your, your iPhone, your computer, whatever, into the black hole, a lot of information in there. Does the information that goes in come out with this radiation? That is the big puzzle. And Stephen Hawking famously said that the radiation does not carry an imprint of the information of what fell in. And Lenny Suskind and uh, Gerard Tuft and others, but they were really the pioneers of these ideas. They would not accept Stephen Hawking's declaration. And we're gonna talk about what ultimately Lenny Suskind describes as the black hole war, a war that I think he would agree that he won, he and his colleagues have won. And we'll go through that as well as the next stage in the battles that are now being waged today. And I see that Lenny has joined us. So let me just give a quick introduction. Many of you know Lenny, of course, through his wonderful popular books, The Black Hole War, The Cosmic Landscape. He is the Felix Bloch Professor of Theoretical Physics at Stanford University. And since 2009, he's been director of the Stanford Institute for Theoretical Physics. He has made tremendous contributions to physics across the board, string theory, black holes, quantum mechanics, elementary particle physics. So it's a, it's a pleasure to welcome Lenny to the discussion. Lenny, how are you doing? Good. Uh, how are you, Brian? I'm doing pretty well. Where are you right now? In, uh, at Stanford? At, at uh, Stanford? No, I haven't been at Stanford, in Stanford University since early March. Yeah, yeah. But I'm a mile and a half away in my house. And you've been teaching, me, like, like all of us, you've been doing the Zoom teaching? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this quarter, I wasn't teaching. Next quarter, I'll be teaching. And um, yeah, but I've been doing a lot of lecturing, a lot of uh, communicating with the public and so forth, and uh, my physics colleagues. Zoom is a wonderful thing. Yeah. You, yeah. Mean, you try to imagine what it would be like if there weren't these tools. I mean, if this would have happened 10 years ago, uh, yeah. it would have been uh, quite an impact. Well, I probably would have... Um, sat down at my desk with a piece of paper in front of me and written some good papers. Yeah. As it is, I had so much contact and so much fun uh, with my, uh, with my colleagues. Uh, physics has done a marvelous job of keeping us all from actually working. And uh, so, yeah, who knows? Now, I remember at the beginning of this, there was a lot of chatter among uh, physicists that were now in the position of Isaac Newton during yeah, yeah, the black yeah, death. Yeah. And, yeah, so. uh, if Newton would have had Zoom, maybe would have come up with the universal law of gravity. You know? Yeah, I think I think we'd still be in, uh, uh, thinking that gravity was due. What did they think that gravity was due to then? Friction? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, action at a distance or something. Action, I don't know. No, that was Newton. Newton, yeah, uh, yeah. Newton was action at a distance. Yeah. Oh, you mean prior to Newton? Yeah, yeah, yeah prior yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Just uh, things, want, things want to fall. Right. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Aristotle, I guess. Aristotle. A very uh, anthropomorphic view of uh, right. So, so if Zoom, if Zoom had existed in when was it, sixteen eighty seven or something yeah. around then, yeah. we'd still be thinking that things want to fall. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Thanks for us. Hey, I wanted to ask you. Uh, I heard just because of where I am at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am about fifteen minutes from a place called the Beaver Kill. Is it true that you oh, spent time? Beaver Kill. You are. Wow. What are you doing up there? So we have a, uh, just a house up here in the middle of nowhere. So since March, we kind of disappeared up here. And somebody mentioned to me that you spent time as a kid. in, in this Oh, yes. And I was just, not just as a kid, as a young man, too. My father was a fly fisherman. He taught me how to fly fish. The beaver kill is one of the great yeah. East, eastern um, trout fly fishing uh, rivers. And yes, I spent a lot of time on it. Ever come, uh, I mean, in recent times, do you uh, ever come back these ways? No, I, I would love to, but just too far away. 
Yeah. So where is your where is your place? Livingston Manor? Uh, no, we are Liberty? about 45 minutes from Livingston Manor. We go the other direction. So if you head out um, toward Andes, we're near Andes, New York. I don't know if you knew that little town. No, I, I don't know where it is. Yeah, most people who stop at Beaver Kill don't know what happens further down the road. It's like north of 96th Street in Manhattan. Nobody knows what happens. <laughs> right. Exactly, right. Uh, so we're on the other side of the tracks in some sense. But uh, right. so, uh, so I was a very urban kid, extremely urban, but still, uh, you know, several times a summer we'd go up to the Beaver Kill, get in the car, drive up there, take our flies, and, uh, fly rods, and fish in the river. Yeah, and your dad was a was a plumber. So I, uh, he was a plumber. Yeah, and he, he expected you to jo go in the family business. Uh, is that he really did? Yeah, he really did. And and you did? Did you do some? You did some plumbing, right? Yeah, for ten years, maybe from about the age of twelve or thirteen till I was twenty two and went away to graduate school. And and yeah. so, what did your dad think, think about your? I, I can't say that I liked it. I was not a very good plumber. And, and but did your dad? I mean, did he support your move from uh, the family? Yeah, well, that's a story I've told uh, many, many times. But yes, he did. In the end, in the end, he was uh, really troubled when I was already married. I had children, a uh, one child, and uh, I had decided I wanted to be a physicist. I went to see my father and told him, and he was pretty upset. In fact, he didn't know what a physicist was. He he had a fifth grade education. He did not know what a physicist was. Mm -hmm. And he made the mistake of thinking that I said pharmacist. Oh. I mean, no, no, you're not going to work in a drugstore. But I said the one word which was guaranteed to, I, I, not intentionally, I said like Einstein. And, you know, at that time, especially among uh, Jews in New York, Einstein was a magic word. Yeah. And he said, are you any good at this? I said, well, I hope so. I think so. Right. And, uh, yeah. That, that was it. That was it. He said, okay, you're going to be Einstein. And that was it. And I, uh, I failed him. I failed him. Yeah, I, think uh, you, I think you've done quite well for yourself, young <laughs> man. Um, <laughs> so, so I want to get into some of the, um, you know, the scientific ideas, contributions that you've That's what I'm here for. Developing. But can we spend a moment on, on other things for a moment that many in the audience will know you from, namely the books, mm -hmm. the wonderful books yeah. that you've yeah. written. No, because yeah. I remember, I, I don't remember exactly when it was, but I think it was in Amsterdam. You told me that you were writing, it must have been The Cosmic Landscape. I think it was your first book. And and you mentioned to me what a blast you were having, yeah. you know, yeah. writing yeah. this stuff. So, so look, it's a great service to the public, but presumably this is something that you deeply enjoy doing. I mean, I the joy comes through. In the I did. I got so into it. I got so into it that, um, you know, I would... I, I took a leave of absence to write the book, I think for pretty much a whole year. Mm. And I had some sabbatical leave, leave of absence. And I would get up, you know, eight o'clock in the morning, sit down at the computer. And by five o'clock in the afternoon, my wife would have to drag me away. It was really yeah. fun. Uh, I really enjoyed writing about physics, but it turned out that I also really enjoyed writing about people. Mm. Well, of course, I enjoy writing about myself. We all do. No, I don't know if we all do. Right. Well, you, but it's interesting that you say that about people because the one, I don't know if you remember this event. I think I was speaking like to the queen or something like that at, at Holland, but we only spoke for a oh, moment. Yes. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and I wanted to, like there was one piece of advice I wanted to give you and right, you didn't need it obviously. But the one thing that I would have said was when I wrote my first draft of my first book, yeah. The Elegant Universe, I left out all the people. Mm. I was afraid that like somebody would get mad that I didn't give them the right credit. And, and, and so I said, look, yeah. let me just leave everybody out. That'll like make it simple. And the book was right. awful. I went book back and put all the people oh, yeah, back yeah. in. Yeah. And, and then when I put the people in, it came to life. It came to life. Yeah. You know, yeah, well, I enjoyed writing about the people from the beginning. I've always enjoyed the history of physics. I enjoyed uh, learning how the people, how the people thought. I've always been very, very interested in how, particularly physicists, but uh, more generally, how people think about things, how their minds work. And, uh, and um, so I, I found it very, very interesting to go back over my, oh, not, not my whole life, but uh, the, uh, the episodes that took place and try to figure out, you know, what was going on in people's minds 
And uh, then when I came to write about it, I just it was just natural for me to, to, to take it from that point of view. Yeah. I mean, you write very much like you speak. I try to do that, too. I mean, it, it, are you basically letting it just flow as if it's a conversation when you're writing? Is that the process? Yeah, it's interesting. My first time around when I write, or whatever I write, I write it in the language that we all learned to write in when we became physicists, the dull, boring, really technical uh, way of writing. And then I have to go back over it. And eventually it starts to flow, eventually. But each time I start to write, each, each new subject, the book had what, 12 chapters, I don't remember. And each chapter started the same way. It sounded uh, like uh, the, the sort of things we write when we write physics uh, papers. And then looking at it, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if I write well, but I do read well. And I do have some sense of when things work. Right. And I look at, boy, that doesn't work. That really doesn't work. And uh, so I start thinking about how to explain things better. And after a while, that technical jargon stuff sort of forms a backbone for what I'm writing. But then it starts to flow and it becomes a sort of natural language. So the first time around, not natural language. Second time around, yes, it becomes. And I, I also, oh, the other thing I do is I read what I wrote out loud. Mm, yeah. That's very helpful. Yeah. I read it out loud and see yeah. what did that sound like? Yeah. No, it's, it's very similar to what I, what I do as well. And it's interesting you mentioned the way we're all trained to write as physicists. Because yeah. I was reading not that long ago, the original Davison and Germer. Mm. And in that paper, they describe in a different way the accident in the laboratory when they were doing, you know, electron scattering off of nickel right. crystal. And they describe what happened. They turned up the intensity too high. They ruptured the vacuum chamber. They had to clean off the nickel crystal. By doing that, they changed the scattering centers. And in that way led to data that confirmed what we now call the double slit experiment. But today, right. if people had that experience, they wouldn't write about the accident. They no, would just write about the result. Right. And, and, and so we have it's, taken some of the human side out of things. Very much so, yeah. Yeah, I find that sad. Um, yeah, I don't know what to do about it. So, so what do you think that we do as physicists? I mean, do you think that we are revealing truths, realities, or just making models of 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 the world? Well, gee, you know that's that's a tough question. It's as tough as any question I can think about about uh, the question of what is reality? Does reality exist? Are we finding it? or we're just making models of it. And um, I think my tendency is to say, put that aside and let's just, uh, let's just go with our curiosity. I'm curious about how this works. Let me try to figure it out. Um, I, I, it's a pretense, but I like to pretend uh, that I'm more of a car mechanic than a philosopher trying to, try, not, not a car mechanic, but somebody trying to figure out how the car works. Uh, that's of course a little bit pretentious. I'm not a car mechanic, but right. um, but I, I do like to th think of myself as somebody trying to figure out how a piece of machinery works, a piece of quantum machinery. So it's not like a car, and um, just uh, try to understand how its parts work, how they fit together, what's going on, how does quantum mechanics fit together with gravity, and not worry too much about. Um, these very heavyweight questions that I know that I'm not going to be able to answer. Yeah. But I mean, it's totally remarkable that we can even, even do that. Right. I mean, Einstein famously said the most yeah. incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. Now there's two ways of interpreting that. One is yeah. the fact that the universe has these patterns, but two that we can figure them out. Yes. I just, I, I just gave a lecture. Well, I gave a lecture at Simon's Institute, I think. And uh, I began by pointing out exactly that, that, uh, that, Somehow evolution created a species just one step above the monkeys that uh, can not only ask questions about how nature works, but follow the dots and figure out how nature works. Mm. And that uh, is very, very remarkable fact. Yeah. That I, I don't know anybody, under, that, does anybody understand how evolution gave us the ability to figure out quantum mechanics? <laughs> I don't know. That doesn't no, make it's very hard to imagine, you know, right. natural selection, 
would tend to select those things that help for survival. And those of our forebears who sat down and thought about quantum mechanics on the African savannah are the ones that probably got eaten because they didn't yeah, see yeah, the yeah, line yeah. that was going up. You know, eaten so. or tripped over their feet. That's right. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, there's this. <laughs> there's also this moment. I don't know if you remember, but in in the 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 television adaptation of the Elegant Universe that you were in. Um, yeah. There was a moment in the beginning where I'm lecturing to a dog. You don't know that at first. I'm just doing, you know, Einstein's equations on the blackboard and there's some student who's not getting it in the camera pans and it's a dog. And the point there was, there are many intelligent creatures on this planet that don't have this ability as far as we know, you know, to figure, <laughs> out, to figure out these things. So what is it that allowed us, us to do that? And so, yes, yeah. it is. It did, is you ever, did, you ever, did you ever read Kafka's Investigations of a Dog? I have not. I don't think I have. Oh, yes. what, what, tell me. Well, Kafka was making fun of physicists, basically. And uh, he invented a dog that uh, became curious and tried to figure out how the world worked. And among other things, he tried to figure out where food comes from. Mm. He didn't understand why, uh, how food appeared in his dish. He didn't understand how it circled from above and came down. And he made all kinds of theories about the... Uh, um, so it's very funny. It's very funny. Yeah, uh, I think it was. I think it was making fun of physicists. Yeah. No. It sounds. Uh, it sounds Kafka esque, and it's uh, <laughs> very, very much. Uh, right. So before we move on to actual science, there's only one other thing I wanted to mention too. Uh, in in uh, the Black Hole War, mm -hmm. there is an unusual and wonderful chapter where you describe a very personal stretch of time when you were utterly obsessed with Stephen Hawking, utterly obsessed with wanting him to see the light. And almost like in your words, you know, Ahab going after the, the white whale, you were like tracking him down. <laughs> so when you were right, I mean, it's an exciting chapter to read, but when you were writing that, and I sometimes go through this too, was there a question of, am I revealing too much of myself? Is this, you know? You know, I know. I, I don't. I was having fun. Yeah, I was having fun writing, sort of enjoying, uh, enjoying reminiscing and uh, thinking about my experiences. I, I wasn't. I wasn't that. Con I wasn't worried about that. No. Yeah. It certainly shows how physics is not a nine to five undertaking. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's all it's all encompassing when. Yeah. Uh, working with these kinds of questions. All right, so- Yes, it's a, it's a combination of 24 hours a day and maybe three days out of the year. Three days out of the year, something happens. The other, uh, the other 24 hours a day, uh, sort of frustration banging your head on the wall. Well, it's good for students to hear that. I, I mean, as you know, I mean, the number of graduate students that I've encountered who just wonder when the big breakthrough is gonna happen, you know, when, and, and, and it's rare. You know, it's it just rare. Uh, it's unfortunately rare. rare, you know. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about some of the breakthroughs of, uh, in some sense, the last 25, 30 years, but we'll hopefully get toward, toward the end. I mean, the things that involved here, general relativity, quantum mechanics, thermodynamics, statistical mechanics, black holes, entropy, entanglement, you know, worm, I mean, it's just an ending list of, of and now, and now, computer science. Computers, so quantum, quantum computer, computer science. science. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, can we just do a brief run through of the general relativity side of things, the puzzles that um, were apparent to you and Gerard Tuff, not apparent to many others, and then where things stand today on all that? So, you know, I made mention before you came on to John Wheeler and his teacup worrying about what would happen if he threw his teacup into a black hole, where would the, where would the entropy go? When did you start worrying about questions like that? Well, okay, so I didn't learn really much about it until oh, roughly 1980, 1981, which was well, seven or eight years after Bekenstein had uh, made his great breakthrough and discovered that black holes have entropy. Um, before that, I was obsessed, like most of my generation of theoretical physicists, with problems of elementary particle physics. Um, I th it was 1980 or 81, I can't remember exactly. It was at a small conference that took place in the mansion of a rich man in, uh, in San Francisco, Werner Erhard, as a matter of fact. Some of you may know his name. Um, and uh, Hooft yeah, the was S there. Guy, the S guy or something, right? The S guy, right, yeah. right, right. 
uh, he was also a physics groupie. And um, anyway, Stephen was there, Gerard the Tuft was there, and a bunch of other people that I can't remember right now. But uh, I think, I don't know whether Gerard knew very much about what Stephen was talking about beforehand, but Stephen got up and said, black holes lose information, that what goes into a black hole cannot come out. Uh, of course, in practice, that's sort of true. But in some very deep fundamental sense, he said there was a contradiction with uh, a basic rule of physics. And the basic rule of physics is nothing really ever gets lost. Information never gets lost. It's called unitarity in quantum mechanics. But it says that, uh, that what goes in comes out, even if it may come out in a horribly scrambled form that's extremely, un, uh, extremely difficult to disentangle. Anything that goes into a black hole has to come out. Anything that goes into anything, into a fire, into a furnace, whatever, has to come out, even if it comes out in a form which is very difficult to decipher. Okay, Stephen said black holes are not like that. Black holes are different. What goes in, in order for it to come out, it would have to exceed the speed of light, and we can't exceed the speed of light. And so black holes are fundamentally different than anything else in nature. And in fact, they must break the rules of basic quantum mechanics. Mm. Um, that just felt wrong. I realized the depth of the question. The question was clearly very, very deep and very, very important. I can't even explain why it sounded wrong. So much of what I knew about physics was ultimately based on a rule of physics. You can call it what, go, what goes in has to come out. You can call it unitarity. You can call it reversibility, any number of different terms for it. Um, and everything I knew about physics rested on that linchpin that, uh, of, of unitarity, let's call it. It had to be wrong. Stephen was giving up quantum mechanics prematurely, not only prematurely, wrongly. He had asked an extremely deep question. And in my mind, and in the Tufts, come to too easy an answer, just that quantum mechanics was wrong. Now, I, felt, think, I just wonder, do you yeah. think that's because Stephen was coming at the world from a general relativity perspective? Yeah, primarily? yeah, I think, and, I think so, but he, quantum side. I, I think that was part of it, um, but he certainly had a very deep understanding of quantum mechanics. He could not have done what he did had he not had that, that deep understanding of quantum mechanics. I think maybe there was also an element that he got so excited by his own uh, revelation that quantum mechanics had to be wrong that he found it psychologically hard to, uh, to let go of it, I think. But I, no, I knew Stephen, it was hard to know Stephen. I know for certain that he admired me. I certainly admired him. Um, to get into his head was so difficult for the, just because of the physical barrier the physical barrier of him not being able to, uh, to communicate. Uh, so I can't really say what was in his head, but he insisted, uh, Rod and I insisted that he was wrong. And uh, from that time forward, I think I felt that that was the biggest problem that I could address the rest of my, uh, whatever abilities I had to try to uh, uncover what was going on there. But strangely, you've also noted that not many other people elevated yeah. this issue the way you did. It yeah, the, that, that's right. The general relativity community, for the most part, just thought that Stephen was right. They said, okay, information is lost in, uh, in black holes. That sort of stunned me. But I guess maybe, uh, well, the, the particular component of the general relativity people were people who did know quantum mechanics and did appreciate quantum mechanics. Uh, so it wasn't that for a lack of appreciation of quantum mechanics, but somehow they just, um, uh, took it as given that what goes into a black hole can't come out. And that was the end of the story for them. Uh, the particle physics community, which was much more centered on the rules of quantum mechanics, the rule that I just called unitarity was an essential component of, uh, of particle physics, they tended not to be too interested in gravity. 
The reason was, I think Feynman said it, he said that gravity is so remote, so remote in the sense of being the gravity, quantum mechanics of gravity, sure. is so remote that it'll be 500 years before we'll be able to learn anything about it. And so the particle physics community had other fish to fry. They had the standard model, they had quantum chromodynamics uh, and so forth. And so they just, you know, they said, don't bother us with this gravity crap. Right. It's, uh, there was very, very few people who uh, really got terribly excited by this very deep observation of Stevens. And so I sort of felt in the wilderness for, I'm not sure for how long, maybe a period of 10 years. Were these ideas pretty much percolating in the back of your mind? Because you were also engaging with yeah. all these other areas too that were more in the forefront at that time. Yeah, right? yeah. No, the, it was not in the back of my mind. It was in the front of my mind. It was. Mm. Yes, I, the, the, that was uh, very troubling. And, and, and so uh, were you and Gerard sort of, comrades in arms on this kind of thing or were you both going your own <laughs> ways and communicating now and then yeah. on yeah. Gerard and I are friends we've always we've been friends for a long time uh you know he's a bit of a contrarian and uh he's a Dutchman which makes him a little bit bristly uh, uh my description of my relationship with him was so uh, very often I would come say, I, I would say to Gerard Gerard I completely agree with you and his answer would be yes, but I completely disagree with you. So, <laughs> but we, yeah, we we uh, we certainly communicated quite a bit. And um, for me, for my part, I felt uh, comforted by, by the fact that Gerard had the same views that I did. I considered him a very great physicist, and I I saw him as being extremely deep. And the fact that he had pretty much the same views that I had was was. Uh, Comforting. And, and so the picture that you guys began to develop, which now has been elevated to a, a principle, holographic yeah. principle, yeah. can you just tell us a little bit about what led to this perspective that, that the information somehow exists on the surface of a black hole when an entity falls in? Yeah. Um, right. I was good. It is literally true. I, I have been thinking a lot about uh, information falling into a black hole. And to me, the big puzzle was it seemed like information had to be in two places at the same time. If you were to, if you were to take the view that Gerard and I did, that information that falls into a black hole is ultimately radiated back out in the Hawking radiation, and at the same time that information can fall through the horizon of the black hole, then it seemed like there was something going on that said that information somehow can be in two places at the same time. Or if not in two places at the same time, very much like quantum complementarity, that either you look at it one way or the other way, but you don't try to, you don't try to look at it both ways. Uh, so somebody falling into a black hole sees the information going into the black hole. Somebody outside sees it outside. Something funny going on about the localization of information. It was literally true. Um, I've told the story a number of times. I think I even wrote about it. And people tend to disbelieve me. They think that I'm uh, sort of making up a little story. It was not a story. I was walking uh, in the Stanford, also Stanford, at that time, there was a small science, small physics display. Uh, we called it a museum. And in the display, there was a hologram. It was a hologram of a very, very pretty girl. And there, there, there was the, the picture of the, of the girl was surrounded by a film. And I knew what a hologram was, but it just hit me. There's an example of information that's being stored in the film Strictly speaking, it's being stored in the two-dimensional film. And if you looked at the film, you would just see a bunch of, carefully through a microscope, all you would see would be random markings with no particular structure that you would recognize. And if you did the right thing with that film, namely shine light on it, but, doesn't, but do the right translation dictionary, you would reconstruct a full three-dimensional object in the interior uh, of this space, which was surrounded by the film. It was literally true. I looked at that and I said, 
could it be that in some quantum mechanical way, the surface of a black hole, the horizon of the black hole is functioning as a kind of hologram where information can be thought of as being stored on the boundary, on the horizon itself, being like the film itself, and at the same time, a translation dictionary would allow you to think of that as information that fell into the black hole. Um, that, that was sometime around 1993. Girard was thinking, I guess, very, very something very, very similar. Uh, and uh, he, published, he published the idea. I, uh, I, didn't even, I didn't even know that he had published it. I found out after writing my own paper on it, somebody, uh, somebody told me that he had written a paper. I couldn't find the paper, but I spoke to Gerard and he told me what he was thinking. It was very similar. And so I just attributed it to him, the basic idea. Uh, but holographic way of thinking about it was your image of how to explain what the black hole was doing then presumably. Yeah, yeah. But there was a, a generalization of it, which I think we both thought about, but Gerard really, really expressed it very clearly that it wasn't just the black hole. If you take a region of space, no matter what is in it, whether it's a black hole or anything else, you should be simply because a black hole carries more information than anything else, that a region of space cannot have more information in it than that, that which can be described as being on the surface of the region of space rather than in the volume. And so it became more than just a theory of black holes. It became a theory, if you like, of a, of a piece of the universe. If you take a piece of the universe, it should be possible to describe it in terms of degrees of freedom, mathematical structures that in some sense live on the surface of the region of space. So- uh, that, That's shocking, of, right? I mean, that's just shocking. It was very shocking. I'll right. tell you, I, I called my paper, The World as a Hologram. Um, I don't remember what Gerard called his. Yes, it was not only shocking, it was also thought to be a big crackpot. Yeah. Um, not too bad. Uh, yes, when I would talk about it, uh, I got the feeling uh, sort of mildly amused that uh, people had thought that both Gerard and I had lost our marbles. We were once good physicists, but here we were um, a little bit crazy. But it might be the good just first... to explain to people how nuts. I mean, we're used to physics being, you know, things take place in the volume of space. You can tinker that's with it right. here, you can tinker with it there, but you're in some sense saying that's illusory because the actual fundamental degrees of freedom don't fill out that much. That's they're right. not as numerous as that. And they're not as numerous as that. And if you, right. And if you try to excite more than a certain amount of structure in that region of space, you will inevitably create a black hole that's bigger than that region. And so there really is a limitation on how much, how many bits of information you can stuff into a region of space and it's not the volume, it's the area. So that's a, that's a, that's a well accepted thing. The first person who really got excited by this apart from Gerard and myself and um, who called me up, wanted to know more Class asked me, please come to his institution and talk about it. it. Was in fact Ed, Ed Witten. Ed Witten, okay. Yeah, he got very excited by it. Right. Yeah. It's and not his style. It's not his style of thing, but you know, he, he's extraordinarily smart and he's a great physicist. And he saw, he saw that, yeah, that maybe that was right. Yeah. I mean, in, in some sense, this is perhaps among the most radical breaks with human intuition that have been yeah. developed over the course of, we're talking evolution before, yeah. certainly evolution imprinted in us a view of the world. Yeah. View of the world it's is funny, it's so, it's so widely accepted now that nobody really seems to understand why, why it was considered so radical. Well, that's always what happens. The young, the young people, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know. Um, so Things go from a crazy conjecture to, well, a crazy speculation to a conjecture to a tool of the trade in almost no time at all. And of course, you, you of course know why it suddenly became a tool of the trade. It was the work of Warren, Juan yeah. Malvasena. 
Yeah, why don't we get to that in, in, yeah, in, sure. in a second? But just uh, so 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 you are saying that even in this room that I'm sitting or any room that anybody else is sitting, in some sense, there is an illusion going on. The illusion that we have the freedom to change things within this volume at will is wrong. The actual capacity of change is far less and sure. can be fully described by data that lives on a surface that surrounds that region. Yes, that is, yeah. what, that is what it says. Yeah, so, so it's understandable that Look, I mean, obviously you always command a great respect, but I can imagine people hearing that and saying, this is going one step too far. I mean, it just doesn't right. seem like it could be right. Yes. And then as but, you say, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I've always admired the, the great detective, Sherlock. And one of his, uh, I cannot, I can never quite remember the quote, but uh, when uh, you've, what was it? When you've tried everything uh, and everything doesn't work, that which is um, may seem most improbable, but if it's all that's left, it has to be the truth. Do you remember the quote? It's a Sherlock Holmes quote. It, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the gist of it. If you've tried everything and nothing works, uh, nothing sensible works, whatever's left over, it must be the truth, no matter how crazy. Yeah, I have little doubt that somebody in the chat will uh, will give us yeah, yeah. that quote in just, just a yeah. moment. Uh, but so then for the black hole story, then, you know, if I pull something out and I throw it into a black hole, mm -hmm. how would this description assist us in dealing with the, the paradox, the problem of the information? Well, the information was, ah, okay. So the way I thought about it at the time, which may have not been, uh, uh, I'm not sure it's exactly the right way to think about it. But the way that I thought about it at the time was the problem was that information that falls into the black hole cannot escape because it can't exceed the speed of light. On the other hand, the Hawking radiation must be carrying off the information. And how did it escape from the black hole? Well, the intuition was that it really, that it really was like a hologram, that the stuff on the inside was to some extent illusory, as you say, I don't know if illusory is right, quite the right term, but uh, some sense a consequence of the mathematics of the hologram and that the reality is really stored on the surface just above the horizon of the mm -hmm. black hole. And that eventually the evaporation of the black hole was tantamount to the evaporation of this film, of the, uh, of the holographic film itself, which, would, which contained all of the information about what was inside the hologram but when it's evaporated, there's no interior, there's nothing left because there's no image left in the interior because the hologram, which was in some sense the reality, has evaporated. But the information was not destroyed. It was carried off by the evaporation products. So that was a little bit naive, but that's the way I thought about it at the time. Now, some of the things that you had to contend with to make it less naive, right? There was this issue that I, I think you you and others raised that, you know, you throw an encyclopedia in, yeah. if, it, if it goes in and yet also leaves its information on the surface, you seem to have these two copies of the right. information. And there's this famous no cloning theorem in quantum That's mechanics right. that tells you you can't actually create those kinds of copies. Yeah, so that's right. So I was, uh, that, uh, that was right. The other person who thought about that a lot was, um, uh, John Preskill mm. and John Preskill. You taught and I me were classical mechanics when I was an undergraduate. You know. Yeah, right. So yeah, there was this problem of the replication of information that in quantum mechanics, the replication of quantum information is not permitted. And so when something falls into a black hole, according to the usual rules, uh, it uh, it can't be replicated in two places at the same time. My answer to that at the time was by thinking about various Gedanken experiments, I convinced myself, I think correctly, uh, that it was absolutely impossible for any actual observation or experiment to see both copies at the same time. So it was much like, um, much like ordinary quantum mechanics where you can either describe a particle as having a velocity or momentum or you can describe it as having a position, but you can't describe it as having both at once. 
I called it quant black hole complementarity, that it was okay to have this duplication of information as long as nature itself prevented any observation from, uh, from seeing both replicas of the information. And uh, so through a series of arguments, I was able to convince myself and other people that it was impossible to have uh, knowledge of both what falls in and what comes out. If you're outside the black hole, you see what comes out. If you fall in with the material that fell in, you see it fall in. You can't be both outside and inside, and so it's really all okay. I think it more or less worked out that way. And, and so taking that complementarity idea yeah. one step forward, it, it raises a, the following question. So many people who study black holes know that if you're looking at an object falling in from the outside, something curious happens. You see the object getting closer and closer to the horizon, but you don't actually see it falling over the edge. You see it redshifted, you see it time dilated and so forth, but you never actually see it cross over. So in some sense, it gets plastered on the outside. Yeah. In retrospect, would that have led one to think in the holographic idea? I mean, was that part yes. of your thinking that that, yes, that, yes. that got you there? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, uh, that was very much part of the thinking. Um, I knew... Actually, I think from reading uh, Kip Thorne's book on the membrane part, Kip Thorne and the other people's book on the membrane, membrane paradigm, paradigm for black yeah, holes. Sure. Yeah, membrane paradigm. This was a technical book. This was not the yeah. Yeah. highly technical book. Uh, more technical than I wanted it to be. Uh, I had known about this picture that everything that falls onto a black hole forms a sort of sedimentary structure that gradually sinks towards the horizon, but never passes it. At least that's the picture that somebody watching it from the outside says. And so from that picture, I, again, there was a sort of Sherlock Holmesian moment. It has to be that way. Even though in a frame of reference, which is falling with the material falling in, it appears to pass through the horizon. It still must be consistent to think about it as uh, from the outside as having been plastered within, let's say, a plunk distance from the horizon. So, yes, that, that was absolutely an important part of it. And yet the thing that you, that you mentioned in there, which is among the things that makes it hard for at least a general person to fully understand this, to the freely falling individual they pass yeah. through the horizon as if there is nothing there. There's no right. impact at all. But from the outside perspective, there's a lot going on at the horizon because all the stuff, as you say, right. is getting plastered there and ultimately being emitted through the Hawking radiation. Yeah. How to, how, to, how to help someone put these two perspectives together or do you simply admonish them using black hole complementarity and say, look, take one perspective, take the other you're going to drive yeah. yourself crazy if you try to think about them both at the same time. Right. Uh, same kind of craziness. You know, a particle, what is a particle? A particle is a thing with a position. If it's anything at all, it's a thing with a position. If it has a position at every time, it has to have a velocity. So how do you reconcile in your head that a particle has either a position or a velocity or not both? And not both. It's the same kind of craziness eventually you give up and you say, those are the rules of quantum mechanics. You, uh, you follow Heisenberg with his microscope trying to locate a particle and both see its velocity and its position, his Gedanken, his thought microscope. And what did you discover? You discovered that whether or not you think a particle has both a position and a velocity, you simply cannot measure both. So from an operational point of view, there can't be a contradiction because you cannot have access to both kinds of information. That was my, that was my opinion about the black hole problem, that it was a problem of complementarity and quantum mechanics in which the two kinds of information were incompatible. No experiment could, um, could reveal both what's going on as the material fell through the horizon and at the same time, watch from the outside. I can't help but ask, though, 
So when we talk in quantum mechanics about particles not having a momentum and a position simultaneously, yeah. one, one always needs to ask oneself, are we talking in terms of the way reality is or the way reality is measured? Because for yeah. instance, there is the de Broglie-Bohm approach mm -hmm. to quantum mechanics. I don't, I don't know if this is an approach that has excited you at all. At times it has me. This is an approach in which particles do have positions and momenta simultaneously in terms of the, the properties that they actually have, the ontology, the stuff that's real in the world, even though, as you say, you can't measure both, but yet they do have both. Whereas in conventional quantum mechanics, they really don't have both simultaneously. Look at the wave function. It's either this wave function or that wave function. It can't be eigenstates, if we use slightly technical language of both the position yeah. operator and the momentum operator, would a de Broglie-Bohm-like interpretation have any role in black hole complementarity? Is there some sense that these things are there, you just can't measure them? You're not talking about the particle now, you're talking about yeah. the information in the black hole. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm not a partisan of the uh, the, the, the Broglie. Uh, yeah, most aren't, yeah. No, no. And if you ask me why, I would say, well, it's some kind of cooked up theory of a single particle, but we live in a world of quantum fields. We live yeah. in a world of multi-particle systems and it gets so Baroque and so complicated when you try to yeah. think about quantum field theory in that language that I just don't think it goes anywhere. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously there are people yeah. in that community who have a different perspective, but that's another yes, conversation. I know, I know, yeah. I know. and uh, you know, it could, who knows? Yeah. Look, I am, I'm a person who knows how to use, I think I know how to use quantum mechanics. I know how to examine experiments from the point of view of quantum mechanics. Am I puzzled about the whole quantum mechanics business of reality and non-reality and, uh, and what the whole um, interpretation of quantum mechanics is? Yes, I am. But I think it was Feynman who said it best uh, when he was asked about exactly this. He says, I'm so puzzled about quantum mechanics that I can't even tell if there's a problem or not. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, no, it's, uh, well, I mean, the measurement problem seems like a, a real issue that we have to resolve at some point, right? We have an algorithm without a mechanism. Well, no, I know, I think there is a mechanism. I think the mechanism of entanglement between the apparatus and the system measured is, is uh, a consistent description of what happens during a measurement. The, and do you take a many worlds view of things? Or, I mean, is it just the way- I wouldn't go that far. Measurement? I wouldn't go that far. I, I find it just very puzzling. Okay, yeah. you want me to tell you when I start thinking about this, where I tend to go? Yeah, I wouldn't mind. All right, yeah. Um, so, Imagine, this is where I start imagining. I want to make a model of the world in which these kind of questions might uh, come up, might even have answers. So take a giant tin can. By a tin can, I just mean a volume of space. Let's forget the holographic principle. Let's even forget gravity or quantum gravity and so forth. We have a volume of space, which is isolated, cl a closed volume of space, and uh, somebody puts a bunch of particles into it. How many particles? Oh, I don't know, 10 to the 50th or maybe 10 to the 80th. What is the number of protons in the universe? 10 to the, 10 to the 88 or so, 10 to yeah. the 90th. 10 to the 80th, right. Puts, puts those particles into it uh, and allows it to evolve. Okay. It evolves quantum mechanically. It evolves quantum rules of quantum mechanics. And after having evolved for a while, we want to ask the question, um, if, not if, but is there an experiment going on at coordinates X, Y, Z in which an experiment is being done on a, on, a, on a single elementary particle and what are the probabilities of the result of that experiment? Well, if you start thinking, if you start thinking about that, how you would analyze that, you begin with the fact that the quantum wave function, the quantum state of this collection of particles is vastly big. It has enormous amounts of irrelevant information in it. These are the branches of the wave function. Most of the wave function describes things or does not describe a world in which there is even a planet at your coordinates X, Y, Z. 
let alone an observer, let alone an observer doing a certain experiment, some tiny, tiny portion of this wave function of this state vector, or whatever we call it, yep. uh, some tiny, tiny, tiny portion of it buried in an enormous, gigantic um, branching tree of possibilities may describe the question that we're trying to answer. The, uh, the whole quantum description is excessive. It has much too much information in it. And how do you extract out anything in interesting from it? It would be absolutely impossible. That to be compared with a classical description. In the classical description, there either is or is not an observer doing a certain experiment someplace. Yep. Sure. There's either is that particles are in definite locations and you can simply go and see whether there are particles forming an observer doing an experiment. Uh, the quantum wave function is vastly, vastly bigger in mathematical complexity. And because of that, it contains information so big that almost all of it would be re re relevant to any experiment. Okay, then you could say, well, all right, look, nevertheless, I'm going to follow that wave function. And what do we do with the wave function? We do experiments. We do experiments and use the wave function to get probabilities. So what's an experiment? The people inside this tin can, if there are any people, and mostly there won't be people, uh, the, the, they're not capable of doing an experiment on themselves. We, we can imagine opening up the tin can, some observer who built the system can then open the tin can, look inside and do an experiment. Okay, what's he gonna find? With overwhelming probability, he will just find some totally random uh, mess of particles. He can measure the locations of the particles or he can measure their velocities, he can't do both. And he'll just get a bunch of numbers which has nothing to do whatever with the questions you might have wanted to ask about what's going on in there. If you wanted to get better information about probabilities, you could do it, but you could only do it by doing many, many, many replicas of the same experiment. Now, my point is here, this is just getting excessive. It's getting out of control. We don't know what the hell we're doing. We, we would not know how to use, even if somebody provided us with the exact wave function, we wouldn't know what to do with it. Uh, so my feeling is at that level, we really don't understand quantum mechanics. But that's it. That's it. That's a really important remark, though, right? Because you know, so. if, 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 we view, if we view quantum mechanics as the fundamental paradigm uh, and we want you know, it to apply to everything, the stuff yeah. in the tin can, the person from the outside looking into the tin can, right. um, uh, the, the statement that we don't know what to do with that structure is fundamentally pointing to deep ignorance in, in, in the very basic laws of the universe, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, no, so my friend, my friend Gerard Tuft, he believes- He has ideas he about believes, this, yeah, he's been- Yeah, he has ideas about it. I don't agree with the ideas. I do, again, again, he's asking very, very deep questions. Whether his answers are the right answers, I, I of course don't know. I don't right. think I agree with them, but, uh, you know, my feeling is anybody who takes the time to sit down and think about what quantum mechanics is and how it relates to the world and so forth can't help but uh, have this sense of confusion, the sense of right. puzzlement. And yeah, I mean, there's how, often there's often the sense that Einstein's resistance to quantum mechanics was a remnant of a dinosaur-like attitude, and it's not. Mm -hmm. no. You know, there's a real issue that Einstein many issues that Einstein was focused upon and it's still with us. Uh, yeah. um, so, so with that, I, I, you know, you mentioned Juan Maldacena and the yeah. work that ultimately brought the holographic principle, this idea that the information would be stored on the surface to its most refined form. That journey, of course, was the end point of a journey that begins with other work that you initiated, which is string theory. Yeah. Um, so if we could just pivot for a moment to string theory. This don't, now, forget, don't forget our friend Joe Polchinski. About he was Joe Polchinski also terribly central, central for that. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. But going further back, so in, in the early days of string theory, 
we're now in the early 1970s. Yeah. Um, you know, this, 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 this idea came along um, largely at first through the study of interaction, strong interaction physics with formulae that were written down that seemed to do a good job of describing certain kind of data sets. You looked at this mathematics and within that you saw the glimmers of string theory. You, yes. So just, just take us back to what that was like. It's a long, long time ago. Yeah. More than 50 years. Uh, it was it was late 60s, uh, 1969 or 68 or 69. Yeah, um, the questions in the physics were not about gravity. They were not about gravitons, or not, not even about photons. They were about hadrons. Hadrons means subnuclear particles, protons, neutrons, mesons, the things which we now know are made out of quarks. Uh, there was a lot of experimental data about them. They were strongly interacting, which means when they collide, they made lots of junk and all kinds of stuff. But they also uh, seemed to have the, a capacity that an electron, for example, would not have. Electron has spin, okay? But you can't spin an electron like you can spin a basketball. You can take a basketball, you can, you can think of it as not spinning, or you can spin it up, and you can spin it up even faster. Eventually, of course, if you spin it too fast, it'll break apart. But a basketball has all sorts of rotational states. Uh, an electron has only one or one or two states of existence, its, its rotational properties. Hadrons seem to be more, in a certain sense, like basketballs. You could rotate them up and uh, the proton could be spun up so that it had a higher angular momentum. Whole sequences of states of higher and higher spin seemed to grow out of spinning up a proton. So uh, that, was, that, that had nothing to do with me. That was experimental physics from the 60s. Uh, a physicist, a very good physicist by the name of Gabriele Veneziano uh, who I didn't know at the time, had constructed a formula for the scattering of hadrons. And it had embedded in it all this information about the possibility of spinning up the particles which collided. And it was called the Veneziano formula. I'm sure that you know what it is. Yep, sure. But it, <laughs> right. uh, and it was a very simple formula. It, it, what did it describe? It described the amplitude or the probabilities for the, the scattering of two particles to result in different outcomes. Now, it was just a function of two variables, a variable called S and a variable called T, it doesn't matter, the momentum of the particles. It was very simple. It had a product of two functions, two well-known common garden variety oh, functions. Oh, let's tell people they were gamma functions. We can- Yeah, they were gamma functions, right? <laughs> A gamma function, two gamma functions in the numerator and one gamma function in the denominator, and that's all that it was. Okay, so somebody came and showed me that uh, the formula. And the thing that struck me was not all the physics that went into it, but the simplicity of it. Mm. And I noticed that it did have this structure that described, let's call them the excited states of the particles that were colliding or the excited states of the particles that could occur in the intermediate states of the collision. And the other thing that I noticed is that those excited states in their energy were equally spaced. They looked like harmonic oscillators. The, the spectrum of energies of a harmonic oscillator are equally spaced energy levels. True enough, the equal spacing was in the mass squared, not in the mass, but never mind. That was a detail. And so I looked at this thing and I said, my goodness, this must be some kind of harmonic oscillator. Mm. And so I started experimenting around. I, I knew a lot about um, uh, <laughs> harmonic oscillators. It was one of the few things I knew about. And so I made a model. The model was a harmonic oscillator, which meant two particles connected by a spring and a third particle, a photon, would scatter off one of the particles in the spring. You could think of the two particles as being charged particles and the 
charged particles would scatter a photon. The photon would be absorbed and re-emitted by the charged particle. And I worked out the corresponding amplitude for that, and it looked an awful much like the Veneziano amplitude. Not quite. Not quite. It looked enough like it that, uh, that I wrote a little paper called the Harmonic Oscillator Analogy for the Veneziano Amplitude. And it was during that period when I was writing the paper that I realized, I, I knew that it wasn't quite right. I knew it was just an analogy that I realized that if you added more oscillators and turned the spring into a string, I called it a rubber band at that time, that you would get exactly the Veneziano amplitude. Right. That was exciting. I mean, it was uh, something, uh, I don't know how to describe the feeling that you get when you, when you encounter a thing like that. Uh, so it worked. I knew at that point exactly that, uh, that what this thing was. And I was pretty certain that hadrons really worked that way. It was kind of interesting, the psychology of it. I was very excited because I thought I was the only one in the world who knew that. Yeah. When you think you're the only one in the world who knows something, and you're about to tell everybody it. I would think, okay, that's, that's uh, something exciting. Yeah. What I didn't count on is that there was somebody else who knew exactly the same thing at exactly the oh, same Nambu time. Oh, Nambu or something? Nambu. Nambu. Yeah. Yeah. Nambu. Nambu, of course, was a great physicist at that time. He was uh, one of my heroes. So on the one hand, I was terribly disappointed to find out that somebody else knew it. On the other hand, if it had to be somebody else, better that it was Nambu. I felt a certain yeah. exhilaration and having discovered something uh, that the great Nambu had discovered. And when you wrote that, those papers, uh, uh, they weren't exactly met with uh, oh, no. standing ovation, right? No, they were, they were rejected by the physical review letters. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, was that a, was that a sense of uh, Terrible. A rejection? Or, Terrible. Yeah. Or did you just say to them, oh, those are silly people and they don't just get it, or, you know? No, I said both. <laughs> <laughs> I've been rejected by silly people who just don't get it. Right, right. Now, yeah, somebody wrote a somebody wrote a referee's report saying uh, there there's no new informat no new um, experimental data in this paper, and there are other derivations of the Veneziano model, so I don't recommend uh, publication of it. And yes, indeed, I was very hurt, and um, I was not a famous physicist at that time. But you resubmitted someplace else, presumably, and uh... it was yeah, I did resubmit the physical review. It was published. Yeah, uh, but it took a long time, and during that long time, I was um, right. Not happy. Not now, a happy. By nineteen by nineteen eighty four. So I I was a graduate student. I started graduate school in nineteen eighty four, and um, you know by that time, string theory had just bubbled up to the surface where there was a basic feeling that if you weren't doing string theory, you yeah. were missing the boat. And yeah. it was the most, I mean, for me, it was, a, you know, if I look back on my years, well, it was the most exci exciting period there because all yeah. of these greats in physics were buzzing around saying, here it is, you know, this yeah. is the thing that we have been looking for. At that time, did you think that the pendulum had swung too far the other way, you know, from, you know, initial rejection, that was wrong, but was it, you know, I guess uh, Greenspan's, you know, uh, you know, uh, whatever the word was, you know, euphoria that wasn't, you know, justified by where we were? No, I, I, uh, I didn't feel that. Um, I did feel that it wasn't addressing this one question, which I thought was so, so central, the question of the black holes. Mm. And then it, until it did, that uh, that it had to be considered um, well what we would call pertur perturbation theory. I didn't think it got to the true depths of the uh, very very hard problems about quantum gravity. Um, but I I think I along with a lot of other people thought that there was a reasonable hope that some version of it, not the precise versions that people were working with. I knew that they couldn't work. They were too supersymmetric. They were too special. Uh, but I did think that there was a good hope that some particular version of it would um, nail the particle physics uh, spectrum, that it would explain 
the three generations of, uh, you know, the three families of quarks, the electron, the neutrino, all that sort of stuff, or at least uh, be able to accommodate those particles, some particular version, some particular, what we call a compactification, which you know very well, some Calabi-Yau manifold or something, which I still know very little about, that that would nail Anything a particle. Anything you want to know, I'm happy to have a... Yeah, right, you, you certainly can. Um, but, you know, after a period of trying and, uh, and particularly a number of things dissuaded me from that, the things which dissuaded me from it were cosmological, the cosmological constant, well, the lack of supersymmetry in the world, um, the cosmological constant, the, uh, the successive inflation, and all those things, together with an observation that I think was Joe Polchinski and Raphael Busso, that who estimated the number of possible solutions of string theory. That by that I mean the number of possible string theories that you could have, and that was gigantic. They said ten to the five hundred. The number may be vastly bigger than that, and uh, so it came down then to saying we have a theory which has so many possibilities that looking for the right one would be like a needle in the haystack and or uh, uh, much, much worse than a needle in the haystack. And uh, so I began to feel that the, that the effort to find a precise version of string theory, which would describe particle physics was probably misguided. Maybe buried in this huge heap of possibilities, there was something, but how do we make a theory instead of finding the right precise one how do we make a theory or something useful about this observation that there are 10 to the 500 possibilities? Yeah. And uh, that, uh, for a period, I think that led me um, uh, to be a bit of a pariah in the string theory community. They didn't want to hear that. Yeah. Now, I remember you and I talking about this, I think it was in Sweden or something at some gathering. And yeah, I asked I you, that. I asked you, do you really believe this? Or are you just trying to stir up the other string no. theories? And, <laughs> no. You know, no, I'm not a stirrer. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely, definitely genuine. So we'll come to, you know, the development that ultimately yields uh, the holographic yeah. refinement, if you will. But um, well, can I come back to string theory for a minute? Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think string theory has had a gigantic success, but the success is not, was not in reproducing the particle spectrum and that sort of thing. It was providing a, an example, an existence example uh, for a theory which allowed quantum mechanics and gravity to be combined consistently. Yeah. And that's no small thing that it, I'm, I'm not talking about the early versions of string theory. I'm talking about the later things, things like matrix theory and ADS-CFT and all these things that Juan invented and so forth, which produced a very a series of very, very precise and exact, let me call them universes, uh, in which quantum mechanics, black holes, and gravity coexisted consistently. So after that happened, if somebody came and to told you, look, there's a contradiction between quantum mechanics and gravity, or well, there's a contradiction between black holes and the standard predictions of gravity, you could say, no, there is no such contradiction. We know that because we have an extremely precise set of examples. And I consider that to be, you know, a great triumph of string theory. Yeah, no, I, fu I fully agree. And, and I'm glad you raised that point because I think as, as, you know, I know, and as many people watching this know, there's a lot of chatter out there, a lot of nonsensical chatter out there, which yeah. tries to make the case that string theory is useless, it's collapsed, it's gone away, something's wrong with the theory. And, and, and the point that you're making, of course, is the right one, which is sure, there are many unresolved issues about connecting string theory to the real world, but to show that gravity and quantum mechanics can coexist in a coherent, consistent manner, a mathematically calculable manner, a precise mathematically calculable manner, that justifies the existence of string theory and all the work that's being done to develop it forward. And it's just really sad when I see people get the wrong impression 
from the I blogs and the books and things right. that, that, that are out there. It used to be in the old days that physicists would do their work and nobody paid any attention and it was great. Now everybody pays attention and everybody has an opinion and everybody uh, gets extremely contentious and political and all that kind of crap. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not nice. Yeah, no, exactly. So uh, a breath of fresh air for the, the actual situation to be more accurately described. Um, but um, let's now turn to the work that was spearheaded initially by Joe Polchinski and, and ultimately results in the achievement of Juan Maldacena, which comes through the technology of string theory and ultimately connects with the earlier part of our discussion, which is this holographic idea. And it's a tough subject to discuss, but can you give a brief summary of, of what Juan found? Yeah. Um, let me first say something about both these two people and more than these two people are currently evolving generation. We tend to think of the generation of Einstein and Heisenberg and Schrodinger as something extraordinary, exceptional that never happened again in physics. I don't think that's true. I think people like Juan and Joe Polchinski and Maldacena and a, a whole, and also the, the great string theorists were every bit, I, I don't know about Einstein. Einstein was a very special case, but they're every bit this, uh, the, uh, the equals of the people in the early part of the 20th century who invented quantum mechanics and so forth. I'm just saying that because I want people to know that, um, that the heroic age of physics has not passed uh, completely. Okay, now you asked me about what Juan did and what Joe did. Yep. So it, when I say it, it will sound like it's not as much as it really was. It's hard to, it's hard to explain how something can be so important and at the same time be very simple. But let me just say, it was extremely important. Joe invented or discovered that in string theory, there were contained uh, a set of objects they're called D-brains they were not the strings of string theory, but they were sets of objects, planes or lines or even points, which were more massive than strings, but strings could simply end on them. So they were like, let's see if we can make an analogy. Um, uh, beads imagine on a wire kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, beads on a wire, that kind of thing. Except the strings could be attached to those beads. Yeah, beads. Yeah. Okay, there were new structures in string theory that were that nobody knew about. Nobody realized they were there. A whole new set of objects. They were heavier, and they were called d brains. Joe worked out the theory of those and um, sort of startled. I, I would say certainly startled me. Yeah. Uh, the one person who I think everybody was startled. I think Ed Witten was sort of close, may have been close to some of these ideas. Uh, and um, so these new objects existed. These new objects existed. And these new objects which existed, let's say there were exa examples of three, bra uh, three brains. Three brains would have three dimensions. Uh, two brains would be like membranes. The Structures, these structures could have objects on them, living on them, like you said, beads. The theory of those objects that lived on them was actually quantum field theory itself, quantum fields living on these D-brains. These quantum fields were, all right, it doesn't matter what they were, but what, what one realized is that these structures, these brains, these surfaces, had all of the ingredients that were necessary for them to be the holograms of the holographic principle. Uh, and he basically worked that out a very, very precise and exact version of the holographic principle in which the hologram itself, that means the film, was replaced by uh, D-brains, a collection of these D-brains, and that uh, the image of this hologram 
was like the actual reality described by string theory. So to put it short, it was a very precise instantiation of the holographic principle. And uh, it was revolutionary, it was shocking, and it came directly out of Joe's, uh, Joe Polchinski's construction of the D-brains, but it has truly revolutionized this area of physics. Yeah. And with this new holographic construction, which did not rely on perturbation theory, it didn't rely on weak coupling and so forth, it provided worlds that we could study in which quantum mechanics and gravity, we knew very, very precisely that, uh, that they were consistent, that they contained black holes. And so that, uh, that, that very much revolutionized the subject. And shortly thereafter, so Ed, Ed Witten writes mm -hmm. a paper where he shows if you have a black hole in the, the bulk, the volume, if you will, the holographic mm -hmm. description is just hot quantum field theory, which has no issue with the unitarity that you and Gerard right, have exactly. been arguing that, that, for. That's correct, yeah. And, and that basically, at least in an abstract level, nails the case that yes. the information has got, I, 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 got to come out. And yeah. How did the community Ed respond? And I, also, to, Ed yeah, and I also wrote a paper together. It's the only paper I ever wrote with Ed uh, in which we connected the ideas of the deep brains with the holographic yeah. principle. Right. And, and so at that point, was there still any resistance from the Hawking general relativity oh. crowd or was that basically it? Um, you know, it was, well, I was going to say something I would probably regret saying. Uh, we can always cut it out of the one we post if you want to try it. But. All right. I was, I was going to say it was like Trump, uh, Trump refusing to admit that he lost the election. Hey, don't regret but of that. Course, of course, there was no similarity, whatever, between Stephen Hawking and the Donald Trump. Uh, yeah, the Stephen Hawking, yeah, I see that oh, analogy. It would have right. some issues, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, that has some trouble with it, but uh, I don't mind if you say it, but let me just make perfectly clear and plain. Yeah. Stephen was a hero and a hero and a hero, and that's it. Right. But uh, yeah, there was, it, it, it did have that sense that people were fighting a dying battle that, uh, that there was no point in even fighting it anymore. It was finished. Right. Um, so within some period of time, that issue was was laid to rest. Um, but it's yeah. still, but, but it's not as though that story is over, right? I mean, so sure. once you know that the information comes out of a black hole by virtue of translating the question into this holographic question where the answer is manifest, obvious that there's no loss of information, there's still the issue of the details of how the information gets out. And so, for instance, Joe Polchinski, who you mentioned before, together with three collaborators, mm -hmm. writes a paper that raises some tension, some issues in Absolutely. trying to think about how the information comes out, suggesting possibility that there's a firewall at the edge of a black hole and so forth. Was that a, was that a surprising paper? Was that one of those papers mm -hmm. where? Very. And for a while, I was, I, I, I wasn't sure if they were right or not, but um, it was very disconcerting. What, uh, yeah, well, Joe, Don Marolf, and two students at the time, one uh, Ahmed uh, Almeri and the other James Sully, uh, wrote a paper in which saying it was logically impossible that after a certain period, an evaporating black hole, a black hole is evaporating after it has evaporated half of its, not its energy, but half of its entropy, that it was simply logically impossible for the black hole to have a smooth horizon, a horizon that you could fall through. In other words, all the features that we thought were true of horizons of black holes. It was, and they even said that it was logically impossible for this black hole complementarity idea to be correct. Right. Uh, the argument was very convincing. It made use of quantum entanglement. It, uh, it was a simple argument. It said, on the one hand, it said that the consistency of the horizon required that the interior of the black hole and the exterior of the black hole be entangled, quantum mechanically entangled. 
On the other hand, it said that the radiation which is carried off by the Hawking radiation will necessarily be entangled with a black hole. And the third element is a thing cannot be entangled simultaneously with two other things. Maximally you can't entangled. Have, right, you can't have the outside of the black hole be entangled with the radiation and at the same time with the interior of the black hole. And so something has to give. And their conclusion was that what gave was that the horizon of the black hole has to become an impenetrable barrier so that in effect, the black hole doesn't have an interior. Interior. Um, this- so Did you lose was, sleep on that one? I mean, like- Yeah, I told, yes, I lost sleep on that one. Um, yes, very much so. And to my mind, at first I was convinced they might be right, uh, that old black holes would have this problem. I, I, I didn't think so after a while. I just thought, no, this is much like the Hawking uh, thing. This is a great question. It's a deep question, very, very fundamental. I suspect they've taken the easy answer and that the hard answer is the one which will um, allow these two things to coexist at the same time, the smoothness of the horizon and the entanglement structure. So, uh, and the answer to that, I think, is the answer that what's called now ER equals EPR. Um, Juan and I started to discuss this over email. It's the only it's the only time I've ever collaborated successfully over email mm -hmm. was with Maldesena. Um, I just sent him a message at some point and said, Juan, this is crazy. There's something wrong with this. Can we try to figure out what's wrong with it? And we batted ideas back and forth, oh, for at least a month, maybe for more than a month, daily emails. I could never get him to answer me on Sunday, but uh, he was with his family on Sunday. But for six days a week, we batted back and forth ideas. Um, and we have both been perturbed by one particular thing, that there was a particular construction it was one of Juan Maldacena's early constructions. It was called the eternal black hole, which was really two black holes, two entangled black holes. And it seemed to violate what Joe and company had said. The black hole on one side was completely entangled with the black hole on the other side. And yet it didn't seem to have this trouble that they claimed would be there if the black hole was entangled with anything else. Mm. And so both of us had been troubled by that. And at some point, Juan sent me a very cryptic message. It was about the things we were talking about, but I think it had one, it was a very short message and it said ER equals EPR. And when I saw that, I said, holy smoke, that is what's going on. And what the, the, uh, I'm sure you want to get to that, so I'll let you ask the questions you want to ask. Well, yeah, no, it's it's a it's a beautiful and 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 deep result. Uh, maybe just for the audience, we have the a uh, little picture of the EPR paper. We can bring that up just to yeah. show people. So it's 1935. Right. Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen write this paper about quantum entanglement that distant particles can be somehow connected by some threads of of quantum entanglement. And then the ER like you're referring to, just for the audience, uh, is another paper uh, that Einstein writes with Rosen. Podolsky got kicked off or something. I don't know where Podolsky was in that one that had to do with uh, wormholes. Now, right. now, I believe it's the case that nobody thought there was any, Einstein didn't think there's any connection between these two 1935 papers. They were just different. I, I don't believe he had any inkling, whatever. If he did, he was even smarter than Einstein. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, one's, one's in the realm of quantum mechanics, the other's in the realm of general relativity. Um, right. And and then in essence, what the email that you're referring to that Juan sent you was saying, hang on, these two papers, there is a deep connection between well, them. Well, they're the same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Um, that, uh, um, we had been talking about it. I mean, it wasn't that we weren't that we hadn't been yeah. talking about very closely related things. Uh, but you said this in such a succinct way. When I saw that, I said, that has to be true. That, yeah. that has to be true. 
And so I very quickly put the story together and I wrote it up. Juan uh, rewrote it, I rewrote it. And, um, and uh, this, but this was another very crazy idea that um, another, with another Sherlock Holmesian um, story to it, that has to be true because nothing else can possibly be true. So the idea, you know, entanglement is a connection between potentially distant systems, which um, has a certain quantum mechanical connectivity to these systems. Wormholes is a connection between possibly distant systems. They can have wormholes connecting them, distant black holes. Uh, we went through all the properties of entanglement in particular, for example, the idea that you can't send a message from one place to another using entanglement, even though it's, you know, people always think you can send messages faster using than entanglement. Kind of thing. Yeah, faster than yeah. light. You can't, you can't exceed the speed of light. And if you yep. look at it from the entanglement point of view, there's a, there's a reason why. And wormholes, something similar, that uh, wormholes connecting two distant places, you would think you could send a signal through. In both cases, you get frustrated by different things. In one case, it's by the properties of quantum mechanics. In the other, it's by the properties of general relativity. And a whole set of things about entanglement seem to be parallel to the things about wormholes. Uh, Juan's message was just a uh, capping the story off and uh, with the clever ER equals EPR uh, phrase. Of course, he had been thinking about these things for a long time. This was not yeah. totally new to him. Um, it hit me very suddenly. I mean, very quickly. I knew that this was the answer to the amps, to the um, to the firewall paradox. And um, so you can explain to us how it answers it. I mean, how, how yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what's behind? Uh, how do you describe the things which are behind the horizon of a black hole? Just behind the horizon of a black hole. Well, whatever they are they are things which are quantum mechanically entangled with the degrees of freedom just in front of the horizon. Uh, you know the story. The story is you understand the evaporation of black holes is by pairs being produced, pairs of particles. One, one of negative energy falls into the black hole. One of positive energy goes flying off and forms a Hawking radiation. And those two particles are entangled. So it is important that the interior and the exterior of the black hole be entangled. On the other hand, after the radiation has been uh, thoroughly, uh, uh, half the radiation has gone out, the black hole is entangled with its own radiation. And presumably it can't be entangled with both. Okay, so let's see, where was I? Good, one resolution of the paradox is that the things behind the horizon of the black hole are actually the same as the things in the outgoing radiation. That what's just behind the horizon of the black hole is nothing but, or the information content is the same as the information content of the outgoing radiation. Well, how can that be? The outgoing radiation is very far away the interior of the black hole is close by, how can they be the same thing? And the answer is they can only be the same thing if there's a secret passageway between the distant Hawking radiation and the black hole. And that's what would be called an Einstein-Rosen bridge. If the outgoing radiation could be thought of as another system connected by entanglement to the black hole, then there could be this kind of tunnel or wormhole between them so that the outgoing radiation would basically be in some sense also behind the horizon of the black hole. Right. And that, that it's, 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 I, I can't do it. I can't do a decent job on this without a piece of paper and a pencil and some equations. Sure. But that's the way the thing went. And um, it was, it was fairly convincing to people. ER equals EPR was kind of, was accepted pretty quickly by this community. But in, in the very recent past, um, a whole gang of very young people 
Well, Almeri himself, who was, uh, Ahmed was one of the people on the firewall paper, Jeff Pennington, other people, very, very young, not much more than students. In fact, Jeff was a student, really sort of nailed this idea that the, that the, uh, outgoing distant Hawking radiation is really the same as the interior of the black hole. They have done for that idea what Maldacena himself did for the, um, yep. for the uh, holographic idea, nailed it in place with a very, very sharp new version of it. Which you know, it's too hard to explain. Yeah, no, and it's it's beautiful work. It is it is it, difficult and right. complex. Yeah. But just for an overarching I idea, you know, when we think about the other forces, not gravity, nuclear forces, electromagnetic force, we of yeah. course have a well-defined quantization procedure whereby mm -hmm. we take the classical articulation of these forces and we bring them into the quantum world. Right. Gravity seems to, I mean, through ER equals E pair, in some sense, the statement is gravity knows, classical gravity knows about quantum mechanics at some level. It's, it's somehow different in, in that way. So what's the lesson there? Is, is, is gravity smarter than we thought it was? And that it already embodies? Or quantum, mechan or quantum mechanics is smarter than we smarter, thought yeah, it was. Smarter, yeah, right. Um, yeah, no, I make this point repeatedly that uh, and I, I sometimes call it GR equals QM. I got, uh, I got oh. enamored of these kind of, uh, uh, <laughs> these little yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what? Yeah. Okay. So you asked me about quantization of gravity. Let me just, let me just uh, explain what that means. As you said, there's a set of rules for taking classical systems, harmonic oscillator, an atom or, or a, a, a orbiting system and converting it to quantum mechanics. The rules were invented primarily by Dirac in 19, 19, around 1930. And um, we've learned that that's the way you take a, a, a theory and convert it to a quantum theory. It worked for electrodynamics, it works for Yang-Mills theory, it works for the standard model and so forth and so on. It even works for string theory, uh, not, not, not in quite the same way. It never worked for gravity. Anytime anybody tried it, it always led to disaster, various kinds of disasters. Black holes were one of them, infinities were another. It never worked. And I think what we're learning now is that gravity and quantum mechanics are too closely connected to pull them apart and then put them back together again by quantum, by quantization, by the rules of quantization. Um, that they just, it's not that they, it's not that they're inconsistent with each other. They're too close. They are too much the same thing to pull them apart and then quantize what you've pulled apart and uh, go back. So ER equals EPR is an example. There's a whole bunch of examples now of basic quantum phenomena, which are very generic quantum phenomena, which reappear in another guise through the holographic principle which appear, reappear in another guise as gravitational phenomena. I won't go through them, but they are like ER equals EPR. Yeah. Two, a, a basic quantum mechanical thing on one side, a basic gravitational thing on the other side, and finding out that they are in some sense equivalent or very parallel to each other. So I don't think we've put the whole thing together yet. I don't think we have a complete story about how these things fit together. It's getting more complete, but, but we don't have a complete story. But I think the evidence is kind of leaning in the direction that gravity is not something to quantize. It's already quantized. It just doesn't make sense. It, it is quantum mechanics. The two go together, hand and fist, uh, uh, and are too close to, to separate. That's my view. That's my view. Um, what do you think it means for the future of, of, of space-time, say? I mean, space-time is always something that we sort of put in from the get-go in our theories. Will it be the case, as many of us have suspected, that space-time is just some emergent thing that arises in certain environments, but is not a fundamental ingredient to build your theory out of? I think that could be. That could be what it's telling us. Uh, 
a bunch of quantum mechanical degrees of freedom with the right kind of entanglement structure can emerge as a space-time. And uh, there's a whole bunch of qubits, you know, quantum mechanical bits linked together by the right kind of entanglement, quantum entanglement structure can have the properties of space-time. That's one direction that seems um, a, a possible direction. But, you know, I've learned not to try to predict too far in the future. Uh, surprises happen. It's yeah. the rule that surprises happen. The only thing about surprises, that's uh, it's not surprising that surprises happen. It's just that whenever they happen, they're very surprising. No, it'd be very surprising if there were no surprises. <laughs> there would be very no and yeah. Generally, when you have a, a good set of ideas, the surprises don't reverse the direction of uh, that you're going in, but they can make it bend off at an angle. Yeah. And uh, so I, I sort of learned not to try to get ahead of myself and to try to guess what the, where things are going, because I'll usually be 50% right and 50% wrong, and I can't guess which part is which right and which is. is wrong. Yeah. So let me ask you one final, final thing. You've been very generous with your time, Lenny. I appreciate that. Um, I'm often asked, uh, where, based on what you anticipated, say, in the 1980s, are we further ahead than where you thought we'd be? Are we not as yeah. far ahead? Uh, can you sort of grade how well we as a community have done, if you look back 30, 40 years. Uh, what's your view on that? Well, these, these, uh, these uh, things which are just one step ahead of the monkeys have followed the dot dots in a way that I could not have imagined. It's been a collective effort. There have been a few, few people who have really stood out. Uh, I, won't, I think I won't mention names right now. A few people have really stood out but it has been a collective effort. And um, it, I, I, I'm just blown away and amazed by how far we have gotten in understanding these questions. I didn't know, I did not. I, I also thought like Feynman that it would be 500 years before we'd really have answers to them. Yeah. That 500 years has turned out to be what, 25, 30, so something like that. Yeah. No, it's so, a yeah, I, it's spectacular, absolutely. Yeah, spectacular. I, I find it very spectacular. And yeah. as I said, uh, to my mind, it means that the heroic age of, uh, of physics uh, has not gone away. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. So again, thanks so much for joining You're us, welcome. Lenny. And by yeah. the way, if you, you ever like in the beaver killer, want to come to the beaver killer, let me know, <laughs> okay. man. Okay, we'll, uh, I'll remember we'll that. Or visit your fly fishing days. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't have my fly rod anymore. I yeah, I'm sure, we can, I'm sure we can arrange something. In any event. Have you ever tried it? I've never tried fly fishing. Oh. You know, I'm vegan, so somehow there's part of me that doesn't want to do that. Yeah. Can you catch and release? Is yeah, that but you can, just take, you can just take the hook off the fly Yeah. and just cast the flies. It's very relaxing. Hey, that's get a, your that's, waders and go out into the yeah. beaver kill and uh, just take the hook off the fly. You all right. Have to all right. I'm a, you know, it's a little cold right now, as you can see outside. We got about three feet of snow behind me. Oh, beautiful, now. beautiful. But when, uh, well, when it warms up. Yeah, you got to wait till you can't get a license until, uh, you know, fishing license until what, April? I forget. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Again, yeah. obviously, yeah, I'm an amateur. Yeah. 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 You get arrested. Oh, is that true? Wow. <laughs> all right. Well, I will keep, I'll keep all that in mind with the advice okay. as well. Uh, so thanks. And look, I look forward to seeing you at some point when this uh, I, yeah, yeah. pandemic thing uh, uh, is over. But thanks for joining us here. Everybody is. Okay, uh, thank, so you, Brian. Appreciated it. thank you. Okay. Talk bye soon. Bye, Brian. bye. All right, everybody. That was a real fun conversation with uh, Lenny Suskind. We covered a lot of ground. It's, uh, it's three o'clock. I'm pretty tired, guys. Um, let me just see if there are any questions in the chat that I might address before we call it a day here. Um, yeah, many people are uh, thanking Lenny for joining us and I thank you guys for thanking him. Um, let us see. Uh, any final questions before we, uh, we wrap it up? Um, yeah, someone asked, can we cite the work that was mentioned? Um, there's not one particular paper that really sums up everything that we spoke about. 
Certainly, if you want to know the story of the of the black hole war up to the early years of 2000s, I don't know, maybe 2005, 2006, you should check out Lenny's book, uh, The Black Hole War. You know, you should buy copies for all your friends. It's Christmas time. It's a great gift. That's a, a wonderful read that goes through the journey in much more detail than we did here today of the information paradox and Hawking's realizations and Beckenstein's insights and ultimately all the way through the holographic ideas of Susskind and Atuft as well as Juan Maldacena's you know, incredible breakthrough in the mid 1990s where string theory gave as Lenny described this concrete realization, this concrete instantiation of the holographic idea. So that's a great, that's a great resource to take a look at. And beyond that, it's mostly the research literature. There's not a whole lot else really to look at at the moment. Um, somebody's asking, uh, Simon Anthony is asking, would Roger Penrose agree with what we discussed here today? And some of it he would certainly agree with. Some of it I think he'd be quite skeptical about. As you heard, you know, I think Penrose has a visceral reaction against string theoretic ideas and just thinks they're the wrong direction. So I presume he would consider any insights that emerge from tools that have been developed by string theory, he would be suspicious of those conclusions. But you know, the point that Lenny is making, it's a point that I've made a lot too, but it's, it's just great to hear it from different people. Even if string theory is not the right theory of the world, the fact that we were able to write down a mathematical system that puts together gravity and quantum mechanics in a systematic, coherent, sensible, logical, paradox-free manner, that's powerful because if, for instance, if Hawking was right, his initial view, I mean, Hawking changed his mind toward the end of his life and actually did come on board and did take on this perspective that the information is not lost. So the, the analogy, and, and already Lenny disavowed it, so this shouldn't be taken any personal way, but the, the analogy with like Trump resisting the election, uh, Hawking absolutely came around to this perspective, but his earlier view that the information would be lost, were that to be true, that argument was so general, the one that he made, that it should apply to any theory that successfully puts gravity and quantum mechanics together. Therefore, it should apply to the string theoretic description of black holes. And the fact that it doesn't, even if string theory is not the right theory of the world, that shows there's a deep issue, a problem with Hawking's argument. And indeed there is a problem with Hawking's argument. You need to include all these other features of gravity and quantum mechanics that we discussed here today that have been developed by many people. The late Joe Polchinski, brilliant, physicist who tragically, sadly died not too long ago, a uh, young man, uh, and, and the great work of Juan Maldacena and many others, including the young physicist that Lenny was mentioning. So would, would Roger disagree? Sure. But I don't think he would disagree with the logical links as being described. Whether or not string theory is the right theory of the world, the logical links are the ones that allow you to conclude that Hawking's initial proposal that the information is lost could not be correct. Okay, anything else before we uh, wrap it up? Um, no, I think we're good. Okay, so again, as you see, we listened to the suggestions you make. A number of people had suggested that we speak with uh, Lenny Susskind. I wanted to do that anyway, so it's always nice when there's consonance between the direction that we are headed in this series that we've been having and the people you'd like us to bring on. Feel free to make more suggestions. We'd love to hear where you would like these conversations to go with topics, people, and we will likely do another one of these in probably two weeks. We've been sort of getting into that rhythm once every two weeks, but maybe we'll do one before then. My teaching at Columbia has just wrapped up, which gives me a little bit more time to think about things of this sort. I should also mention that the EPR and the ER papers that we made reference to, it turns out that we're, since those are 1935, we're in the 85th anniversary of both of those papers. 
And in celebration of that, and in celebration of this unexpected link between these ideas, we are going to have a World Science Festival program that is going to explore the connection between entanglement and wormholes. I don't know exactly when that's going to be available. We're in the process of putting that program together. But just so you know, for those of you who want to hear more about this and hear other voices weigh in on the subject, this will be one of our World Science Festival programs in the not too distant future. So if you want to know about that, you should uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm going to be announcing as these programs become available. That's at B Green. At Twitter, you should follow World Science Festival. I don't know what your screen looks like right now, but somewhere on your screen, I think there's a button where you can follow World Science Festival, both in terms of YouTube or the social channels, Twitter or Facebook as well. Okay, that then wraps us up here for today. Thanks for joining us. And I look forward to carrying on these uh, conversations in the not too distant future. Okay, Brian Green signing off, bye. Thank you.